Not long ago I played and I reviewed Men of Iron, Their Birth of Infantry by Richard Berg, published by GMT. And as the subtitle says, this is a game of medieval combat which demonstrate, demonstrates how uh, infantry supported by missile units could overcome the power of cavalry that up to that point was considered to be the most uh, powerful and effective part of an army. And today I'm reviewing a game that I played more recently, Infidel, The Secret of Men of Iron. Infidel, The Supremacy of Cavalry. Again, you see a game with a strong, a strong uh, theme, a strong common thread. Still by Richard Burke, still published by GMT. Uh, this game is set in the Crusades and you will have battles that, as the subtitle indicates, uh, will show the supremacy of cavalry. Cavalry really is the protagonist in this game and that also means that the game has more mobility, a completely different um, change of pace from the battles of Men of Iron that tended to be a little more static. Uh, since I have many things to say about this game, I divided my review in three videos so that you will be able to identify the parts that you may be more interested about. You don't have to watch the entire thing. Of course, if you do, I appreciate the first video you're watching right now and it has the introduction, you're watching that too. After this I will cover the rules that you have in Infidel that are new from Men of Iron. Either modifications or completely new things. Um, although my videos kind of assume a certain familiarity with Men of Iron, if you don't know the system I suggest you watch my other review uh, that will give you a general overview of the system um, and then probably you will mm, I'll appreciate better the meaning of the changes that uh, were made from Men of Iron when um, the game Infidel was designed. There are really a couple of different things. Uh, the second video is a general overview of all battles that you have in Infidel. I'm kind of proud of that video. It took me a while to make it because setting up the battles in Infidel is quite a chore. It takes some time, I have to say that. Uh, so after I played each battle, then I set it up again and I made a video about it to tell a little bit about how, it, uh, how the battle works. Um, this will be a video with the more narrative style. You don't, it's not as technical as, as, technical as the first uh, video. And maybe you don't even know, need to know much about Infidel um, or uh, Men of Iron. It just tells you how these battles play. And then you have a third video with my conclusions. So a lot of work to do, a lot of things to say. Let's get started. Well, let's talk about some of the rules that are new in the system and that help understand the different flavor that Infidel has when compared to Men of Iron. First, the subtitle of the game is The Supremacy of Cavalry and this is obtained in different ways. For example, missile units in this game only have a range of two axes as opposed to Men of Iron where the most powerful units had a range of three axes when firing at the enemies. And again, that already makes cavalry relatively more powerful than it was when compared to missile units. Another thing that is different is in the activation roll, um, as quoted from the rulebook, after his first successful continuation die roll, a player adds plus one to his continuation die roll for each new such attempt. That means that, like in Men of Iron, you can still have a side gaining momentum and managing to activate a series of leaders one after the other, however, this will not continue forever. Here the system has a sort of self-balancing built-in countdown, so because of that cumulative plus one, there will be a time where a side simply cannot activate leaders anymore and the game will go to that side. So you still have momentum, but again, with limitations. Something similar happens with continued attacks that suffer from a cumulative minus one. That means that you still have units that will be able, if lucky, to uh, launch several attacks during the same turn, one after the other, but still uh, you have a limitation here because they will not be able to exterminate an entire army uh, by themselves if they get lucky. There will be a time where the cumulative minus ones will stop the continued attack from a single unit. 
counter charge has been modified from Man of Iron and I'm really happy about this. In Man of Iron, the defending unit that managed to counter charge would become the attacker and the attacker would become the defender and the previous uh, defender would launch a charge that would just be as powerful as a regular charge. I would have liked to see counter charges being a little less powerful than regular charges. Counter charges are mounted uh, from an adjacent space, they don't have the same momentum, they are put together at the last second. Uh, I just would have liked to see counter charges being a little less powerful than charges and in Infidel I guess that the designer uh, thought the same thing because in fact uh, counter charges have been made less powerful. In Infidel in fact counter charges will work differently depending on the unit that is being counter charged. If a cavalry unit is counter charging against a charge and the counter charge is successful then uh, the attacker is still the attacker, the defender is still the defender, you don't have the role reversal that you have in Man of Iron, simply put the charge is annulled and becomes a shock attack. If uh, the defending unit is counter charging against the shock, then the attacker is still the attacker, the defender is still the defender, and I like that, but the shock attack suffers a minus two modifier um, on the, for the die roll. Only if the counter charge is against a, fi a unit that is firing against the counter charging, so only if the counter charge is against a missile unit, then the charge works like in Man of Iron. That means that the uh, cavalry unit manages to put together a counter charge and to attack the uh, firing unit, and in that case, the defender becomes the attacker and the attacker the defender. But overall, that role reversal doesn't happen all the time, and to me, it, it just makes more sense. I just like it better this way. Then in this game you have several new units or old units that have some special new things. For example here you have the overall commanders. They work like regular commanders but you see that they have some stars there on their uh, on their counters that indicates that there are overall commanders on top of activating you as, as normal and commanding units as regular commanders, they also land a plus one for the activation rating of other leaders that are within their command range. So they just coordinate the action of the other leaders. Also, some leaders may be charismatic. They may have a bonus in terms of charisma. The charisma bonus is there at the bottom left corner. Sometimes you have overall commanders that also are charismatic, but the two things overlap, but they are not always the same. Charismatic leaders lend a bonus to knights that are stacked with them. They just have that effect to motivate the knights during combat. Knights, extremely important new type of unit. Only the Crusader player has them. The knights have great combat values, both because of the defending values that you see printed on the counters, but then also the bonuses that the knights have on the combat matrix are pretty amazing. The knights are never retired. When a knight suffers a retired result, the knight will retreat instead. And you know, it's huge because the units that retire are really they really affect the side that has units retiring. They're never considered out of command. These guys are basically just so motivated, so um, from a certain point of view, so full of themselves. You know, their bravery and sense of honor sometimes really borders insanity and egomania. So, for example, they can charge and counter charge, which is good, but they never have any charge reluctance. Sometimes, you know, mounted units would refuse to launch themselves against pikes of the enemies. Haha, <laughs> not the knights. It's like, you know, they're invited to a party. They would always be happy to charge infantry units. In fact, uh, so much do they like to counter charge that they will always counter charge a unit that fires against them. And that is not always a good thing. Sometimes uh, an enemy unit is firing against them, and if they counter charge, they start running against the firing unit. Actually, they may get separated from their main army, and it may be bad because that may lead them to be surrounded by the enemy. So sometimes, uh, the enemy may decide to fire at them just to tease them, knowing that they'll be mad and they'll just run and counter charge to vindicate their honor. So actually, if the owning player wants to restrain the knights from counter charging against a missile attack, the owner has to roll on a table and see if the leader of that 
the command is able to restrain them. So there is a chance actually in which they will not counter charge, but they will always start to counter charge a missile attack. But this is an interesting thing. I think it's a, it's a pretty simple rule, but it gives a lot of historical chrome and flavor. It really gives you the sense of these knights that are powerful, but also they are a little bit, you know, they are hot ads and it's not so easy to control them. There are pluses and minuses in their being so independent and the fact that they will always counter charge is definitely a minus. Then you have mixed units, meaning units that are infantry but they have capabilities similar to those of the missile units. You have the archers with flails that can file as archers or they can shock attack as infantry. However, if they have reaction fire, that means if they have acted as archers during um, the, the opponent's uh, moves, then at that point for that activation they have to defend as archers. Yeah, I mean, it would be too easy otherwise, you know, best of both worlds. You defend as archers while using their fire, and then you also defend as infantry. Well, no, you had to commit to one. So if you defend with your action fire, then they have to defend as archers. That, of course, means that they are less effective in defense than if they are defending as infantry. Javelineers can move missile fire, throwing them javelin, and then they can attack and defend as infantry. That is good, but still they're not the strongest infantry unit. An extremely important unit, maybe the most important in the game, a unit that really affects the uh, way in which the game plays is the light cavalry archers. The only the Muslim player has them and they're basically light cavalry that has archers and can fire. These, however, these units have special rules and they can behave in a way that no other unit can. They can leave an enemy zone of control in the same turn by spending plus one movement point. All of the units have to stop when they enter zone of control. So they're pretty slippery. They can get close to an enemy and then run away. Important, th this is important because it can be combined with the other special rule about them, which is that they can fire during movement. Other missile units have to move and then fire, and then they cannot move after they fire, they can. They have to spend plus one movement point if they're in an enemy zone of control, but they can still do it. So they have a type of attack that no other unit in this game, or in Men of Iron, has, because they can run close to the enemy, fire against the enemy, and then run away. They will have to spend a total of plus two, one for leaving the zone of control, and one for firing in case they approach the enemy to, in a direction such as uh, that it brought them to in the zone of control. But they can do that, move, fire, and run away. As if that was not enough, they can also retreat before shock, which is something that other mounted units can do too, but also against charge from the cavalry and or from you know heavy cavalry or knights other units cannot do that other mounted units will be able to retreat before combat if it's shock attack but not charge these guys are fast and again they are extremely slippery they do have to roll for disorder if they retreat before a charge but still there's a chance that they manage to do it and it's a pretty huge thing because it's a good way for them to uh, annul a, an enemy charge so they can be kind of hard to catch they can be a little bit of a pain in the neck for the um for the um, crusader player and they really are an important unit in defining the flavor of this game which is really about mobility you have powerful knights that are going to charge like crazy light cavalry archers that are going to run everywhere, escape from everywhere. It's a game that has much more mobility than you have in Men of Iron and this really uh, makes the experience of playing this game completely different.